Hey everyone, welcome back to Policy Punchline. Here at the show, we interview scholars, policymakers, and business executives about some of the most frontier ideas and urgent issues in our world today. I'm Princeton Senior Tiger Gao. Here with me is my longtime co-host, Owen Ingle. Owen, would you like to introduce our very renowned and established guest today? Yes, I would. And thank you for having me, Tiger. So today we have on Sir Stephen Cowley, who is a theoretical physicist and international authority on fusion energy. He became the seventh director of the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory, the PPPL, on July 1st, 2018, and is a Princeton professor of astrophysical sciences. Most recently, he served as president of Corpus Christi College and professor of physics at the University of Oxford in the UK since 2016. Cowley previously, before that, was chief executive officer of the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority, the UK AEA, and head of the Cullum Center for Fusion Energy. He's a fellow of the Royal Society and of the Royal Academy of Engineering and was knighted by the Queen of England in June 2018 for his role in fusion science. Sir Cowley also has roots in the Princeton space and in 1985 he received his PhD from Princeton University in Astrophysical Sciences and returned just a few years later to serve in the lab as well. So Sir Cowley, thank you so much for being here today. You're very welcome, and um, I'm looking forward to this interview. Uh, you've instructed us to call you Steve, so I guess going <laughs> forward, we'll start calling you. Yes, please do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, Steve, I'll was, I was start with a very generic question, which is uh, you study so many fascinating um, and, and both uh, physically and metaphysically uh, complex questions, uh, plasma theory, plasma turbulence, nuclear fusion. Those are all terms that um, Owen and I, and I bet most of our listeners will struggle to understand what, what they mean. Uh, would you mind starting us off with what exactly some of those terms mean and, and what you study? Well, I study plasmas, and plasma is the fourth state of matter. Um, and it's matter when you get it very hot. So when you heat matter up above about 10,000 degrees, it, um, the, the atoms uh, shed their electrons and become just the bare nucleus and the electrons float around separate from the nucleus. And that ionized or charged gas is called, called a plasma. Um, and the reason we're interested in it, it really twofold, one, one of which is that a, a lot of the matter in the universe is in the form of plasmas, so we need to understand it to understand the universe. But the other is because of uh, the quest for nuclear fusion, probably the perfect way to make energy, but um, uh, has a, a bit of a downside that we haven't yet mastered um, the, uh, the, the physics and the, and the, and the engineering of, of fusion power. Um, fusion is, is this way in which small atomic nuclei fuse together to make bigger ones. So you can take hydrogen, you can make helium out of it, and you can take helium and make carbon out of it. And the stars do this. The stars are the, um, are the engines of building up all the different chemical elements that go into our body. If you think about your body, it's really just made of stardust. Um, and I've studied that really since my PhD, studied the, uh, the plasmas that we contain in magnetic fields in order to get them uh, to, to fuse. The, the real problem with fusion is that you have to get your fuel to about 200 million degrees in order to make it fuse. So you have to hold it in some kind of bottle that's, um, that's not, not made of steel or, or glass or anything, but made of something that doesn't melt. Um, and the way we do it in our experiments is to hold plasmas in magnetic fields, in a sort of cage of magnetic fields, as though you're sort of wrapping, wrapping this ball of ionized gas around with magnetic field that pushes it off the wall so it doesn't touch the walls. Um, and I've studied that now for close to 40 years. You touched on so many interesting concepts there, but I want to kind of dive into two really quickly. The first is, is one, you mentioned that it's the perfect energy source. I'm kind of interested in, in your qualifications there and, and your thoughts there. And then the second is when we think of the sun and the, the reactions and, and interactions going on there, they're quite different from what's going on in the lab. No, there's different elements involved. So what, what are some of the differences in terms of uh, fusion energy uh, out in the rest of the world? 
or, or the rest of the universe and fusion energy in, in the Princeton uh, Plasma Physics Lab. So um, it turns out that there's <laughs> the sun does fusion very, very slowly. The, it, the sun is hot because fusion is going on in the center of the sun, but it does it very, very slowly. Um, it takes hydrogen and it builds it up into heavy hydrogen, then the heavy hydrogen, it builds it up into helium and then you know, it's, it's actually working its way towards carbon. Um, and we want to do it faster than that to make energy. So there is a, one fusion reaction that's a lot easier than others, and that's between heavy hydrogen, which we call deuterium, and super heavy hydrogen, which we call tritium. And that fusion reaction is the easiest one to do. And the reason they're kind of hard to do is because you have to push two nuclei together so that they get really close. I mean, close we mean, you know, more than um, a, a, about, a, a, about 10,000 billionths of, of, a, of a centimeter. It, to get them that close, you have to push them against the fact that they repel uh, because they're charged particles, they're positively charged. And when you, we've only ever figured out that you have to, the only way we can figure out to do that is to make them really hot so they run around like crazy and every now and again they slam into each other hard enough that they actually fuse. Um, and so the deuterium tritium, that's deuterium is heavy hydrogen, tritium is super heavy hydrogen, that reaction is the easiest one to do and that's the one we have been doing at Princeton. Um, in the 1990s at Princeton, we held the world record for the amount of fusion, which was uh, 10 million watts of fusion power came out of our experiment. Um, it was then beaten actually at the lab I used to run in Britain, Cullum, uh, by the European machine, which got 16 million watts. Um, and that remains the world record at the moment. So other question, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, the first part of the question is you mentioned that it is the best and uh, ideal energy source. So what exactly were kind of the qualifications that you're using there and, and what makes fusion so uh, enticing? So, you know, energy is a very interesting place because we see um, the, the renewable energy sources like solar and wind are doing very well. Their cost is coming down and we're able to generate, you know, electricity from solar and wind at, at very low costs. But they have a fatal flaw and that is that every now and again, you have a period of time without any sun and without any wind. And therefore you have what we call intermittency. And so you need sources of energy that you really can switch on and off at will and will you know, will be sustainable. So you want something that has a, a lot of fuel um, and can go on for millions or indeed billions of years. And you want it to be safe and you want it not to produce any waste that will leave for future generations, i.e. no CO2 into the atmosphere and no long lived radioactive uh, waste for people to uh, worry about in future generations. So fusion actually satisfies all of those criteria. It's um, the fuel sources, there's at least 30 million years worth of deuterium tritium fusion. There's 60 billion years worth of deuterium deuterium uh, fusion, which is harder to do, but presumably after 30 million years, we'll figure that one out too. Um, it's safe because um, it's very easy to stop the reaction. Um, and it doesn't produce any uh, uh, long-lived radioactive waste or any uh, CO2. So in that sense, and you can switch it on and off when you want to switch it on and off. Um, in that sense, it's the perfect energy source. It's not quite the perfect energy source in the sense that, you know, we don't yet know how to do it. Um, that also makes it a, a really great science problem to work on. I mean, you don't want to work on science problems that are easy. You want to work on hard ones. Well, that's very true. Um, and, and just thinking about that, it, it, as far as the, the nuclear world, um, a lot of people, when they hear nuclear energy, they think of fission energy. And, and uh, as you mentioned, nuclear fusion has also been around for several decades at this point. So 
Um, and, and nuclear fission at this point is, is generating power for hundreds of power plants all over the cross world as we speak. And, and this generally, people believe it stems from military purposes, the famous Manhattan Project and America's, America's interest in nuclear weapons. So at the beginning of the Manhattan Project, it was known that nuclear fusion was on the table as well. We saw um, folks like uh, Professor Enrico Fermi was having conversations about fusion. So why did the US end up going with advanced research into nuclear fission instead of fusion in the 1940s? And how might our world today look a little bit different if that, if that research had been placed um, on the other side? You know, I'm, I'm a person who believes that um, the big threat to the planet right now is global warming um, and climate change. Um, and that we need to put in place as soon as possible some th uh, measures to reduce our carbon emissions to essentially zero um, and let the, the planet sort of heal itself. I think we've seen this year that the, you know, the the number of extreme weather events, uh, the effect of a global warming on drying out our forests and making them easy to burn, all these things suggest that we really have to take this extraordinarily seriously. Um, and I don't think, um, I, I, I believe that we should use nuclear fission as part of that solution. Um, so I'm not a person who believes that nuclear fission should not be put into the mix. Um, it, is a, it is sustainable for long enough that it will help us bridge to a fully sustainable future. Um, I don't think we'll do fission forever, partly because there isn't a, a fission. Fission happens because very large nuclei are unstable to breaking basically in half. And so uranium will spontaneously break in half um, and, will, and you can trigger other pieces of uranium to to break in half by what's called the chain reaction. Um, and it turned out to be the development of fission happened in almost a matter of months, certainly within a year. It, right at the beginning of the war in 1939, um, the first fission reaction was seen just before the war, literally months before the war. And then um, in the first few years of the war, people didn't make very much progress. But by 1942-43, right, they suddenly, you know, Fermi put together his first nuclear reactor and uh, we had nuclear reactors by the end of the war. Um, fusion turns out to be much harder. Um, and although people thought fusion would follow, you know, shortly afterwards, it didn't. And it partly didn't because fission reactors don't work at 200 million degrees, they work at 600 degrees. Um, and so that there's the, the physics and the engineering proved to be much, much simpler to do for fission. And I think that's good because fission is also a carbon free energy source. It is also something that um, can provide particularly what we call the firm energy that needs to back up solar and wind um, into the future. And I'm a great believer that we need to um, we need another generation of fission power stations as we're developing fusion, because fusion, we haven't had the first fusion power station yet. And to get to really commercial fusion is going to be several decades. And I think we should be doing something about climate change now. You know, I mean, just absolutely trying to wean ourselves off fossil fuels before the end of the 2020s. Steve, I guess one popular opinion a lot of that, that has been circulating is that the future of nuclear energy at large is really not government funded research or, or larger plants of fission, but rather uh, these smaller plants that can generate massive amounts of electricity, smaller modular plants that can be mass, mm -hmm. mass produced. So I remember, I think uh, as of early 2018, there were 75 separate advanced fission projects that were trying to answer this question even in North America alone and they were all uh, empl employing something I, I think one of the leading technologies the small modular reactor SMR
are this kind of slimmed down version of conventional fission systems that promise to be cheaper and safer. And then we, we saw a lot of the innovations that did happen and, and fail. And I guess Bill Gates is a big proponent of it because he uh, promoted the company TerraPower, which was doing some, something like this. So um, do, do you see that uh, right before we, we talk more about fusion? Uh, do, do you see f fissions? The, the, why are there so many startups or people still working on, on this in that sense? Well, there's a lot of startups in both fission and fusion right now. Um, and people, because people are realizing that this is, you know, we're in a, we're in a global crisis to try and replace fossil fuels. 80% um, of our energy still comes from fossil fuels. And, um, you know, weaning ourselves off cheap gas is going to be really hard to do. We made a good progress in actually reducing our carbon CO2 output by going from coal to gas, because gas produces roughly half the amount of CO2 for the same amount of energy. That's great, because some of it is hydrogen and it makes water. Um, but but um, the small so going to the issue of small modular reactors, I think it's very, very important development. The thing that makes, so there are two things that are making fission not very competitive at the moment. The first is that building fission plants takes an awful long time and is very, very expensive. Because, because of the regulations that go with fission, part, part of that is to make sure that everything's very, very safe. That regulation that goes with, with fission means that you know, it takes two to 10 years to build a fission plant. So all that money that you're investing is sitting there for the best part of 10 years, um, not generating any return. And that right away makes it very, very hard to make money out of fission. The second problem that fission has is that it's very people intensive because again, regulation. So um, Ralph Izzo, who's the um, chief executive of PSENG here in New Jersey, um, it, I had tea with Ralph about nine months ago and, and we were talking about this. It really is, he, he, you know, he, he has to employ more than a thousand people on a site for a gigawatt fission plant. But for a similar size to get natural gas, you know, plant, about 15 people. Um, and that's really because of regulation and because of, of all the issues surrounding it. And so that they're, they're expensive to operate. Um, and at the moment, because gas is so cheap, you know, it's easier just to build another gas plant and, and burn some more gas. And, and that, that's a bad thing for the planet. Um, and I will say because of, um, you know, commitments really not by the US government, but by local, you know, by states, right? We're seeing support for keeping nuclear power going in states because that is a way to, eating and you know to reduce our carbon footprint one interesting thing that you mentioned there is as far as fission goes is kind of the time scale and and for some of the private investors kind of that return on investment uh time scale is it similar in the fusion world i've i've heard some some accounts that it would nearly be like a 30 year uh, wait before that capital was returned. It, do you see that as a potential issue? Is it quite that long? Is that kind of a aggressive estimate there? I think we have, you know, I, people keep, always ask me how long for fusion. Um, and I don't know the answer because what happens in technology is a technological breakthrough suddenly changes the whole game. But I think we need some breakthroughs in order to get commercial fusion to work. We know how to do fusion. We just don't know how to do it at a cost that you, you will want to pay. Um, there's, a, there's a spectacular experiment being built in southern France called ITER, I-T-E-R. It's the biggest experiment humans have ever done. It's an over $20 billion experiment. Um, and it'll be the first time that fusion not only produces some power, no electricity, but just heat. Um, it, uh, but but it's, it's self-sustaining, right? When, when a fusion reaction happens inside your plasma at 200 million degrees, 
um, it releases energy in the form of a neutron, which is a neutral particle that goes out of the plasma and, and, and provides energy into the wall. And a helium nucleus that stays in the plasma that heats the plasma. So the fusion can heat itself. And that self-sustaining part of it means it can burn in the sense, just like a, a fire burns, right? I mean, because you've got a fire burning in your fire, you put another log on the fire, it will get hot and start to burn. And you can sustain the burning by putting new fuel, cold fuel onto the fire, but the fire is hot enough that it'll keep going. If you have a very weak fire and you put another, another log on the fire, you'll kill it. Um, and the experiment at Princeton in the 1990s was too weak to be self-sustaining, but each was gonna be self-sustaining. But ITER is an experiment. It's not a demonstration reactor. Um, it, it's too expensive to be a future power station. Nobody's going to want to pay that kind of money for their electricity. So what we're really doing at Princeton is trying to drive that cost down so that we can come into the market with something that's competitive and can supply electricity to people. And that requires some innovation. And you know, one of the things that I'm trying to do at the lab is to stimulate as much Innovation, innovative thought about how we're we going to make it cheaper um, and, and therefore get to market quicker. A couple of good ideas. We could be in, you know, in the 2030s, we could, we, we could be somewhere. Uh, sorry to cut you off, Steve. I didn't mean to, to did, did, did you? No, 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 I just, just, I think, you know, and, and if we have to go with the big clumsy kind of approach that we know works, right? I'm not sure that we will, uh, even in 30 years, get to market. Um, you know, economics is brutal. I guess just to quickly follow up on that question, though, what do you identify as some of the main challenges and obstacles, not just scientific ones, but also in terms of political ones that, that, that are really preventing us from getting to the next stage of, of breakthrough for, for fusion, for example? Let's say uh, the president of the United States or someone comes to you and says, Steve, I really want this to happen. What do you need? Do you need money or, or do you need more commercial investments or do you just need more PhD students or in talents and passion? Or is, is it because of computer science or physics or, or something else? What, what do you think is holding us back from achieving that vision? I know this is a very abstract. I mean, and, you know, I don't know anything, right, that will work, right? That, but I, I can't imagine that 50 years from now we won't be able to do future. Right, because we're, we've done some, we've tasted success, right? The question is now to do it in a way that won't be prohibitively expensive. But, um, so what, how quickly could we do it? For instance, if the government said, right, we're gonna spend a hundred billion a year on that research, because it's so important. I mean, that'd be a huge amount of money, right? A hundred billion a year, but it would be comparable to the kind of money we were spend, spending to go to the moon, right? Not very different, actually. Um, if you go back and you look at what was done during, that, during the 1960s to get us to the moon, and you know, it was a crash project, and certainly comparable to the Manhattan Project in the middle of the war. The Manhattan Project, um, the industrial capacity of the Manhattan Project that they developed in those two years that they developed the atomic bomb, was the same size as the automobile industry in the United States at that time. And they did that in two years, right? So if you throw everything at it and say it's a national priority to do it, how fast could we produce fusion? Probably within a decade. I mean, you, 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 but, but what do I know, right? I mean, because it would have to have a series of innovations, but if you're spending 100 billion a year, now you might say, well, 100 billion is a lot of money. The world energy market per year is 10 trillion, right? So it's, 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 a, it's 100 times bigger. And this is a bit of a race, right? In between, uh, like there's obviously international cooperation. I believe ITER is, is a prime example of that. But also it's, it's a competition of sorts between the powers in the world that be. Do you, do you have any insight into the possible tensions that are going on in that space? Because I know China is, is aggressively putting money into nuclear fission, 
I don't, I don't quite know their nuclear, nuclear fusion. Well, so they're doing it with fusion too. They have a plan to build a machine that's a bit like ITER, but slightly bigger and actually make electricity in the end of the 2030s. China seems to be having a plan in everything now. It's like yeah. quantum, quantum computing, <laughs> <laughs> nuclear. <like. laughs> They've got some cash, as it turns out. Um, yeah. And I, I would say, you know, I respect my Chinese colleagues because um, I think this is worth, you know, doing. Um, the U.S. approach and the Chinese approach are taking this differently. I mean, I think we believe in the U.S. and, and we did in the, in the U.K. too that we won't get to commercial fusion without some innovation. The Chinese are betting on taking the designs that we already know and engineering them and building those big, rather large monolithic fusion reactors um, out of that. The Chinese energy market's actually rather different than ours, though. I mean, there's an awful lot more people and there's the mega cities of China. Um, you could imagine having reactors that are four gigawatt. I mean, because if you look in places, China li lines up, you know, 10 gigawatt, 10 one gigawatt reactors in a row um, because they have so much energy need. Um, and whereas we tend to think of, you know, scattering gigawatt reactors about all over the place. And this is kind of the opposite of small modular reactor. You know, small modular reactors, people are talking about 50 megawatts, 100 megawatts, so a tenth of a gigawatt, that kind of size. Um, but the Chinese, you know, they have such enormous uh, energy needs. Um, they might have a different kind of market and they might have need for sort of very, very large fusion reactors that could provide a backbone of their energy system. So it's interesting, you know, that the world isn't homogeneous when it comes to energy. In the past, I know that, that fission was a bipartisan issue in, in the U.S. Congress. And, and thinking about it uh, from, the past, uh, from the perspective of the past few years, the, the U.S. fusion program has been dwarfed by China and a couple other countries who are putting more money into this. And it, it, you, the U.S. doesn't quite loom as large. And I know you're British, so... Um, I'll, I'll promise not too many U.S. questions following this, but just thinking about this dynamic, what do you think led to this deterioration in funding or the deterioration in focus on fusion and even fission in, in some degree? It, was it just a lack of faith, a general uh, across the board cut in energy research? What exactly has led us to this less than um, number one position? It's interesting, you know, um, the U.S. hasn't been investing in building new machines in fusion um, very much. You know, well, since the Princeton machine in the 1990s, we've been doing relatively small scale stuff. We are investing in, in ETA. We're doing a ninth, one ninth of ETA. Um, but it, I, I, your, your question, it, 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 some very smart points there. I think there is not been much faith that we're on quite on the right path and i think that, that that's changing over the last few years department of energy and, and office of fusion energy science is getting more money from congress to do fusion research and i think people are starting to say let's look at the end game right how do we go from where we are right now to electricity on the grid right and and, and sort that out um i came into fusion to do that and, you know, I love doing physics and I'll do physics about anything, but, but I really came into, into fusion because I wanted to do physics on something that I thought would make a difference. So kind of changing back uh, a little bit, talking more about the nuances of fusion. So a lot of people have concerns or, or those that know the industry well about the fact that you're putting all this energy in and creating this heat that's unbearable. It's millions of degrees. And so the most famous example, I believe the jet, um, the jet reactor had an input of, of something like 25 megawatts, please correct me if this is wrong, got an output of 12. And it was considered this huge success in the world of, of nuclear fusion. So thinking about that in terms of our input to our output and, and what the, the challenges are as far as uh, the fusion efficiency, 
where do we stand there today after a few years after JET? And where do you see the next 10 years? That, of course, was the, the driving force to build ETA, was to actually create a device that would produce much more energy than it consumed. And because JET was not even, I mean, it was, it was 24 megawatts in, it was 16 megawatts out. Right. So, by the way, the 24 megawatts came out as well, but you, you, 24 megawatts going in created in total 40 megawatts coming out, right? But that's not going to get you to come to net en energy production um, because you then got to drive a turbine and the inefficiencies, etc. cetera. You, you, you could never do it with that. But um, ITER is going to produce 500 megawatts out right for less than 50 megawatts in so at that point um you, you would say that we had we had got to the, the nirvana of sort of producing enough energy that it's usable um and it but but each is not actually going to make any electricity from it because they decided it's an experiment and that they wouldn't tie themselves down essentially by making electricity so we, we're at that stage, Owen, where we think we can do that, right? But this is a bit like, you know, the Wright brothers have got the, getting the plane off the ground. Once you've got the plane off the ground, then you've got to say, well, what are we going to do with the airplane? Um, um, so many, this is very kind of quasi philosophical, but so many technologies were developed for war, right? Airplanes got a big boost by the fact that there was a, a world war shortly after airplanes were invented and uh, people poured money in to make better airplanes because it gave you an advantage in the western front in world war one um the red baron um and all that uh we don't have that driving you know fusion development and we don't have that driving um you know energy development at this time um, so that imperative to win um, is, is less strong. Um, and thinking back on, on fusion routes, kind of relating this back to an earlier question as well, there are fusion bombs and there are, there are fusion reactions that are in hydrogen bombs. So does this technology pose any sort of threat? I know with kind of the, the fission in the global sphere concept, a lot of people are worried about these countries that have nuclear reactors potentially getting weapons that we don't want them to have. Is that a, a possibility at all with, with a fusion reactor or uh, fusion energy as a whole? Um, okay, there's two points here already that, that um, just to sort of clarify. Um, yeah, fusion goes on inside the hydrogen bomb. And the way that happens is you have to get the fuel up to that you know, 200 million kind of temperature. And you do it by exploding an atom bomb next to it. Um, and that triggers the fusion reactions. Um, it's not a way to do controlled fusion at all. Um, and you certainly can't do it um, unless you've got an atom bomb. Um, and so there's no pure fusion bomb. Um, but so, so it's, on its own, fusion is not a, um, a proliferant technology. Because you just if you know how to do fusion, you still don't know how to make a bomb. Right, um, but um, there there is questions with all nuclear technology, like um, fission power stations. They have to be inspected, so somebody isn't using that power station somehow to to you know um, engineer a new bomb, um, make plutonium, make a bomb out of that plutonium, etc. And that's standard in every nuclear power station that they're inspected and they're, they're what's called safeguards that just check that that the, the power station isn't being used to, to um, you know, make a bomb. Um, fusion won't have any of these problems. So the proliferation risk from fusion is, is far less um, extreme. Um, you know, it, it, it would be a very, very hard, a hard route to making yourself a bomb um, that you first started by making fusion reactors because we don't know how to do those and we do know how to make bombs. Um, at least some people know how to make bombs. Um, and uh, so, you know, there's not a danger of proliferation of 
you know, or people using this as a route to become a, a nuclear weapons state or something like that. Um, which is one of the reasons, of course, people would, would prefer, you know, uh, a fusion as a long-term energy source. So it's both non, or it's non-violent, it's good for climate, good for the, the rest of the world. I, I feel like there's a lot of positives rolling along here. So, so not, uh, switching topics slightly, I'd love to kind of talk about some of the emerging technologies within the fusion sphere. So I know that the, the PPPL came out with a report, sorry, the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab, uh, that, um, it came out with a report that the fission fusion hybrid molten salt reactor. Um, and the report was called it an uh, energy, clean energy game changer. So I'd kind of love to hear your thoughts on this uh, hybrid molten salt reactor. And then also some other emerging technologies or, or less developed technologies such as projectile fusion um, that might play a role in, in dominant uh, fusion research moving forward. Yeah, um, well, molten salt reactors um, have many advantages over conventional uh, fission reactors. And th this is a two-stage answer. So molten salt reactors people are pursuing as a way to make better fission reactors. And I think, you know, some of that with uh, some of the, the groups on the West Coast um, and the Chinese are going to make a molten salt reactor and that kind of thing. That's been done before, though. The first molten salt reactor, I think, was at Oak Ridge um, in the 1950s. Um, and so that's been known, but the, the, there's a problem with molten salts. <laughs> They're very corrosive. So one of the problems is that, you know, it has the advantage that, that all the reactions are going on inside the molten salt, and that is your coolant, and it, from an engineering point of view, this looks a very sweet solution to the problem. But if it's contained in steel, and the steel um, corrodes very rapidly, then you will have a lot, of, you'll have to keep making an awful lot of steel containment vessels. Um, so that was always sort of the problem that went along with molten salt reactors. Introducing fusion into that, you get an advantage of that. So you use the fusion to drive it. So it's not what we call a, a it's, the reactor isn't critical. It's not self-sustaining. The fusion is used to turn it on and off, basically. So if the fusion stops, the react, everything stops. Um, and that provides some safety advantages. But um, I'm not very keen on the idea of mixing fission and fusion at this point, personally. I mean, I thought it was a brilliant piece of work, uh, that work. But mixing f fission and fusion means that, that fusion starts to inherit some of the, of the problems that fission has. You know, I, I'm a supporter of, of, of using fission at this time to, to deal with carbon. But I'm not a supporter of fission as the long-term solution because we do make radioactive isotopes that become radioactive waste that we will have to store for a long, long time. And while we could do that with modest amounts of waste, if we did fission for hundreds and hundreds of years, that will be quite a lot of waste to store. Um, and I think, you know, it would be good to move on to fusion be before we build up too much waste in, in, in that area. Um, and so I don't really want to mix the advantages of pure fusion uh, with fission. And these hybrid reactors are where you use fusion to drive a fission system, have those, they have you know, long-lived radioactive waste. Some of the bigger issues coming out of the radioactive waste space in, in nuclear fission have been linked to kind of the newer movement of environmental justice, thinking where we put these nuclear plants near, near different communities and, and stuff like that. Where does nuclear fusion fit into that conversation? So, so this has been a, a big movement within the energy world, especially within kind of the, the democratic primary as that progress and, and some of the ideas that have come out of um, potentially next President Joe Biden's platform is, is social and environmental justice. So how does nuclear fission fit into this framework and, and how might it uh, improve environmental justice conditions moving forward? So because it doesn't have the accident potential of a conventional fission reactor, um, and 
because it doesn't have, you know, the um, problems, the release of radio, possible release of radioactivity as in, you know, Chernobyl. Um, it can be cited, fusion reactors can probably be cited very close to, to human activity, right? You don't have to keep them well away from the city or something like that. Um, and so this in terms of environmental justice is a good thing. Um, the other good thing about it is that we don't have to mine uranium. You, know, you extract the fuels essentially from seawater. Um, so everybody can get it. It doesn't, it doesn't depend on you know, you having the right kind of minerals under your country or oil fields or you know, any of those things. And that's good for, for environmental justice too. Um, <clears throat> and I think the, the other thing, of course, is waste. It doesn't have a waste stream that you have to then bury in the ground or you know, take somebody's piece of ground and put it in a tunnel underneath that ground. That's not what, you know, what you'll have to do with, with fusion. Fusion has a little residual radioactivity at the end of the life of the plant, but it decays with half-life of about five years, five to 10 years. And so if you just keep your, if at the end of the life of the fusion plant, if you just wait um, roughly 50 to 100 years, um, then it will be completely safe to handle. Um, and you, you can go back to reuse of the steel that you've used and all that kind of thing. Um, so there is no, that you don't have to find a Yucca Mountain or something like that. Yucca Mountain is where the US stores its um, nuclear waste at the moment. Um, and actually most of the nuclear waste is stored on the sites of, uh, of, of power stations. Um, you know, that you won't have to do that with fusion. Um, and that's one, again, one of its big advantages. I keep telling you, it's the perfect way to make energy. Steve, I think Owen and I at this point are utterly convinced but I would say that many voters simply do not believe that company and researchers knew the promise of new technology can avoid old mistakes. So yes, they, 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 they could, we're talking about the scientific nuances between fission and fusion. When we talk about tragedies such as Chernobyl and things like that, they won't happen again, but it is very, very difficult to craft that political message or even scientific message to get that out there. So, I guess during your career, what have you found to be an effective way to communicate with the public? And, and, I, and by public, I mean literally gen, the general public uh, who get their facts, especially these days from Facebook and from <laughs> a, a, a lot of the other sources that are, that are not um, as credible. It's a very insightful question. Um, you know, uh, it, it, it's been very interesting that in the UK, um, the environmental movement has become pro-nuclear because they see the greater risk from CO2 than from any of the problems that fission might have. Um, modern fission power stations, I mean, they don't, you know, we haven't had um, problems with any of the modern fission power stations. Or Chernobyl was a, a particularly badly designed Russian reactor. Um, and so th it is interesting how public opinion can shift. Um, but it, there's this issue of who, do they, who, do, who does the public trust, right? And the trust in science, it's not very good right now, especially in the United States. Um, the, you know, the trust that, you go back to the beginning of the 1950s and coming out of the Second World War, where scientists were thought to have helped the country, and they did help the country defeat the enemy. Um, and that gave scientists a prestige and scientific thinking a prestige. And so people were willing to listen to the scientific point of view on things. Um, I think, you know, we've seen the rise of sort of anti-science type ideas you know, more superstition, more, well, scientists, the, the, the other part of this is perhaps more, more significant, and I, I shouldn't be too self-serving as a scientist. Scientists get money from governments, and to do that, we sell. 
you know, we have to sell our programs and we go to governments and, you know, that's a big part of my job. Um, you go to governments and you tell them that what you're doing and ask them for lots of money. Um, and so they're seen as self-interested. But here's the problem with science, right? Who's the best people to, to judge that science? It's the scientists, right? And other areas of public policy, you know, politicians can have a good idea, a good understanding of whether this is a good or a bad idea because those areas of public policy, they're experts in. But in the area of, you know, funding science, they're reliant on the scientists to tell them what is a good idea and what is a bad idea. And yet the scientists in some sense are compromised in that, in that, um, in those policy decisions. Um, so I'm not actually answering your question, which is very political of me, but um, how, do, how do we get through this kind of thing? People are excited by, you know, you, people are excited by new ideas. Um, and so when I talk about fusion, I think people often, you know, they just like the idea that we would be able to make energy the way stars make energy. I'm super excited. I'm going to start trying to build one in my home <laughs> starting, starting tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. If you, have a, if you have a cool idea, Tiger, just <laughs> tell me. Um, <laughs> well, actually, I did want to ask as well, thinking about the private sector, and you mentioned earlier that that has emerged, and, and through our research, we found that Commonwealth Fusion Systems is one successful private venture that mm -hmm. has, has had two massive amounts of, uh, of fundraising rounds. We've also seen Chevron, a energy giant invests in fusion startup Zap Energy earlier this year. So private investments in nuclear fission companies have become popular and also private investments have become super popular in nuclear fusion. So uh, how are these potential market movers? And, and you mentioned the government funds a lot of these scientists. How, do you guys interact at all? And, and I guess, what do you generally think of the private fusion sector? So I think this is interesting because they are funding a lot of new ideas. Um, and to some extent, you know, the way Edison used to actually innovate, Edison used to make 50 different versions of whatever he was inventing. And then he would pick the one that worked the best. And then he would, he would, he would modify that. It was almost, you know, it was almost natural selection and genetics, right? He was, he, he sort of, he evolved his, his inventions um, along a sort of natural selection kind of route. Um, fusion is very difficult to do that. And that's why having new investors in it fund ideas that maybe others haven't tried and, and move it forward can help us all, I think. Um, Commonwealth Fusion are doing very interesting things is that they're trying to develop high temperature superconducting magnets to make even higher magnetic fields than we currently use. Um, and the stronger the magnetic field, the stronger the cage that you hold your 200 million degree um, plasma in. And so the idea of being able to produce those kind of fields um, will, will really help fusion, um, even if the actual sort of reactor route that they're pushing is not the right reactor route, they will have produced some technology that will help all of us. Steve, I think Owen brought up the private sector, which reminded me of the quantum computing sector right now, which is a, another uh, subsector of the physics world that is driving a lot of, you know, uh, private investments. Google had the quantum supremacy and things like that. I know we're coming to a, almost an end of the interview. I, I do have a wild question because uh, when, when it comes to quantum computing, we interviewed a Yale professor, uh, Stephen Gervin, who is a mm -hmm. very frontier person in, in the field, and I asked him this question, I wanted to ask you again, which is uh, that it's, it seems that scientists uh, and philosophers have a lot in common because you're both working on these complex questions, the scientifically and metaphysically unanswerable questions. So we, we have uh, uh, these anecdotes such as Alan Turing was famous for publishing philosophy journals and debating with Wittgenstein and such and so on. And you, uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on how you brought in your mind up. Do you ever think about philosophy? Do you ever think about uh, some of these metaphysically unanswerable questions and find inspiration from these discussions? Oh, well, sure. You know, I mean, to stay current as a physicist, you want to go to colloquia and listen 
you know, I'm interested in quantum computing. I think it's really a, a neat set of ideas. Always being challenged by new ideas. I mean, you know, the, um, the enemy in life is boredom, right? Well, the worst thing you can be is bored, as far as I'm concerned, right? Uh, I'll do anything not to be bored. And so stimulating my brain is one of the major things that I seek out, right? And, and new ideas, new things. Um, I like arguing. I, I like meeting people that I disagree with politically so that we can, we can hash it out, right? Um, and, you know, I think that's one of the, the shames of the current political climate is that, you know, um, I might be a Democrat or I might be a Republican, um, but, um, you know, there are legitimate reasons to be either. Right, and there are legitimate reasons to believe that maybe capitalism is the best way to run the, the economy. There are also legitimate reasons to believe that we should have socialized medicine. Um, but these debates, are, they're just great to have, right? I mean, to, to hash those out and, and ask yourself what, you know, are we sure we, we, we really understand this? And, you know, how does that work? Um, these are great things. Next Thursday, I've been invited to a discussion of um, science and religion. Right, and they sent me a bunch of questions to answer so that they poll everybody who's going to this. So we're all going to sit around on Zoom eating our dinner and talking. Um, if, if they need a Scientologist for a conference attendee, I can, I can join last minute, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I mean, it's just, you know, when, when you do these kind of things, um, and, you know, I don't believe in God, right? But I don't not believe in God either. Right? Because I think that it's one of the most interesting questions, you know, why the universe, how the universe, um, what is it about, right? All these kind of questions, well, you know, maybe we can never answer those questions, but it's an extremely interesting question. And people always say things like, you know, science and religion, they're, they're, they're different things, right? You're answering different kinds of questions. And I don't think that either. One of the things you're doing with science is you're trying to explain the universe in terms of a simple set of, of rules. Right? Most of our scientists, I think, think underlying, although we don't know the rules, are the laws of physics, which we only partial or we only approximately know. Right? Um, but there's two interesting questions about that. The first of all is why those rules and why not another set of rules? Right? Um, and who made those rules in the first place? Right? And does the universe always follow those rules? Because if you look at religious history, of course, there's the history of miracles. And supposing, right, you had a situation where the universe is going along, following the laws of physics, and then something happened that simply does not follow the laws of physics, right? What would that be, right? Would that be evidence of, of a supreme being? We'd probably take it to be so. I think my mom would think so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, I walk out across Lake Carnegie. Right. And, uh, and everybody's just utterly amazed. <laughs> um, that, that's, you know, so the idea that science and religion don't, don't, don't mix, I don't think is. Um, and so I, I find these questions about, you know, religion and science extremely interesting. And as I say, I don't not believe in God either. I'd like to know um, about all kinds of things. So my last fun question is far less philosophical. Um, and I also get the pleasure of asking the wrap up. So I'll do them both at the same time as I know this is uh, nearing, nearing your time of availability, uh, nearing the end of your, your available time, sorry. Um, but one, you've been knighted. What a cool and interesting fact. Um, so what was that experience like with, with the queen and, and how did that come to being? And then the second question is our wrap up for all our guests, which is what is your punchline? Because uh, it's called policy punchline. So if you had one message about nuclear fusion or uh, God or anything else, uh, what is your punchline? 
So sorry, sorry. Those are two very conflicting questions. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'll just tell you that it, it was an enormous thrill to be knighted. I mean, just you know, and I am a great, I'm a great admirer of the Queen, um, who has discreetly been the head of state um, and not interfered with British politics, but yet in many ways been the unifying force in Britain. Um, that must have been very difficult to do for all of her life, and she's approaching 100. And so I'm an enormous admirer of, of her. Um, and it was just a, a huge thrill to be knighted and uh, an enormous honor, um, and uh, probably not deserved, actually. Um, so let's get to the punchline. Um, we can't afford not to develop fusion. We can't afford not to develop fusion because we've got to be able to sustain our civilization um, it's so that our future generations can lead the same kind of extremely privileged lives that we lead and that people from you know underdeveloped countries can lead can, uh, the privileged lives that we in the United States and Britain live. Um, and that rests on energy. Energy is not, um, energy is what powered the industrial revolution. Energy is what stopped hunger in our countries. Energy is what made us warm. Energy is fun, right? I would say one of the, the most fun things you can do is sit around a campfire where you're pumping energy out into the atmosphere at unbelievable rate of knots but just the feeling of the heat on your skin is one of the most transcendent um, feelings you can get. That's an amazing punchline, Steve, that, that, that really is. Thank you so much for joining Owen and I today for, for this fascinating conversation. We started with some basic science facts and concepts and we moved on to some wild conversations. So thank you so much for joining us today. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. And this concludes this episode of Policy Punchlines. Uh, please visit us on policypunchline.com and please go follow uh, Steve's work, uh, both in uh, Fusion and, and beyond. Please, please uh, keep, keep uh, following his work. Uh, thank you so much for listening today. You've been listening to Policy Punchline, a podcast generously supported by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. We would also like to encourage you to follow other podcasts produced by Princeton University, such as Politics and Polls by the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Policy Punchline is intended to be informational only and does not reflect nor represent the views of Princeton University or the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. For more information on subscription, donation, volunteering, or contact, please visit policypunchline.com. Thank you again for listening.